Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing? We're awake. All right. Here we go. Well, like Luke said, my name is Patrick, and I get the pleasure of walking us through this text this morning. So uh, we're in First John. We have been for a couple weeks, and um, but before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, have been here at Gateway for three years now. Uh, I came on during the pandemic. Uh, which literally my first day in the office was April 1st, which was the first day the office is closed. So it was great. And um, I met everybody digitally. And then for the next like six months, awkwardly had to reintroduce myself in person. So, uh, but I've been doing this job for three years now and uh, it's been great. Uh, I'm married, my wife, Lynn and I uh, have been married for five years. Um, and one thing, so we are experts, by the way. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be uh, answering them afterwards. But, um, but one thing that's interesting uh, that I've noticed with marriage is that if you are doing it right, again, because we're experts, um, if you're doing it right, if you're actually intentionally pursuing each other purposefully, you begin to become more like your spouse in certain ways. Um, and you begin to care about what they care about, you don't like what they don't like, um, which this can be a good thing and a bad thing, um, which, so uh, I'll give you an example. So for example, my, uh, I I can now fluently quote shows like Gilmore Girls (laughs) and and, uh, Gossip Girl, um, and which is a good thing, by the way. And uh, these are excellent shows. I actually have an opinion about them now. And I can actually, like, I found myself actually at summer camp. I was talking to one of the people serving with me, and she's a huge Gossip Girl fan. And I ended up actually, like, out-quoting her. I was like, remember that one thing? Where, like, and she's like, no. I was like, oh, okay, this is real. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, and I'm, I, so, but, but the interesting thing is, yeah, as, as you begin to become, closer to your spouse over time, as you begin to get more acquainted with them, you begin to take on some of their personality. And that's kind of what we're going to get into this morning. That's kind of what John's going to be getting at, is is the more that we are around Jesus, the more that we should actually become like Jesus. And so that's, that's the title of the sermon today. To follow Jesus is to become like Jesus. So before we start, let me just pray for us, and we'll get into the text. Father, you have given us the gift of your spirit. Lord, and by your spirit, we dwell with you here and now. Lord, your presence is as real as it was when Jesus walked the earth. We can know you as well as we know Jesus when he walked this earth. So Father, this morning would you once again invite us into the mystery of your kingdom, the way that you work. God, would you help us to lay down our presuppositions? Would you help us to not be familiar in a way that's unhelpful? God, would you invite us into yourself? God, we pray we want to dwell with you this morning. God, we desire to be with you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our, uh, our text this morning is uh, 1 John chapter 2, 3 through 6. And um, a couple of things, just background really quick. So John, we, most likely, is this is the John that wrote the gospel of John. And so this is the John that walked with Jesus for three years. Um, and so what's cool is that John actually got to experience Jesus. So you're reading the words of somebody who walked with the incarnate Christ, which is amazing. And so everything that he's telling you is not like, well, you know, I heard about, like every sermon you've ever heard is about somebody who has heard about somebody who was with Jesus. This is somebody who's been with Jesus. And so the, the context of this letter, which is actually more of a sermon that John's writing, this is written probably in the late first century. And John's writing in the, his later life, he's older now. He was like a young guy, a young buck when he walked with Jesus. And now he's older his life ministry has carried out, and he's now writing to a church, a, a series, a network of churches in modern-day Turkey that have actually become part of 
his family, his ministry. He's birthed and strengthened these churches and now he's writing them to encourage them because they're experiencing all kinds of problems. So they're experiencing outward pressure from an idolatrous culture of Hellenism that is Greek religion that is trying to form and shape them. And they're also, for, they're also experiencing internal pressure. So they're experiencing division within their own ranks. They're experiencing false teachers. And so John is writing to this church with love and he's trying to remind them of who they are, whose they are. He's trying to say, remember your confession. Remember why you began this journey. This is, it's hard for us to understand, but John, John's writing to a people who are in a, a Jesus movement that's brand new to the world. Countercultural, it's becoming persecuted by the Roman Empire. And so John is saying, my children, remember who you are. Remember the mission that you're on. Remember the kingdom of God is here and you are moving with it. And so that's John's encouragement to them. And so as we get into this text, just remember that we're, we're reading from a real person. We're reading from a real writer, somebody who was really in love with Jesus, who really walked with Jesus. And so we're actually going to, as you can see, we're going to just walk through the text together. So is that cool? All right, great. So the, the first thing we're going to notice, uh, if you don't know this, biblical writers use patterns, they use repetition because this is an oral language. And so if you were going to hear this and you were going to try and key on what's, what's the thing I'm going to remember, it's going to be through repetition. So John's no different. So he uses things like repetition and pattern to help convey his meaning. And so we have three sentences, but imagine if you were to go through this entire book with this slow patient reading of his, of his letter, you would actually begin to see this in a whole new way. So the first thing that we're going to see, let me, let me, let's read this together again, and let's just go slowly through, and then we'll, we'll start marking it up. And by this, we know that we have come to know him, who's Jesus, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So the first thing that we're going to point out today, first word that we're going to notice is the word no. No. If, and by this, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same ways in which he walks. So this word know, the Greek word is Inoskos, which is experiential knowledge, right? So if I were to, if you were to ask me, like I just told you, my wife and I have been married five years, and if you were to go, hey, tell me about your wife. Like, what, what's she like? And I were like, well, are you ready? She has brunette hair. She has fantastically white teeth. And, get this, she is five foot six. You'd be like, thanks for the doctor's report, weirdo. <laughs> right? That's, that's like clinical knowledge. That's like, I, that's like, that, that's not, I, that you're like, have you actually like met your wife? Like, are you, are you just like looking at her driver's license? Like, what are you, what is it that you're doing? Like, you would expect experiential knowledge. You would expect me to say something that hopefully most of the people wouldn't know, Right? Which is, by the way, the worst pressure when you're like, tell me about your wife, and you're like, oh, crap. Um, it's like something original. Oh, gosh. So, but, but that's what we're talking about. So this word no is experiential, not intellectual, right? Which is important for us because we live in an intellectual culture. We like to be intellectually challenged, intellectually convicted. We like to be intellectually tickled, right? And then we like to walk away and not be held accountable for any of it, right? And so John is saying, right, by this we may experience the knowledge of Jesus. 
we may actually feel, experience that we have come to experience him. It's a different kind of knowledge than we're comfortable with. That goes below the surface. That actually gets into us. It, co- it, it requires something of you, right? Like a relationship does. That's what it means to know Jesus. And he says, if we truly know Jesus, we'll keep his commands or instruction, right? And so that's, that's how we know. But the next word we're going to pay attention to is keep. By this we know we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, for whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth's not in him. Whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. So the next step of this journey in knowing Jesus is to actually keep. And this is an active verb. This is like, you have to intend to do this. This isn't like, you know what? I kept my driver's license. So you didn't get a criminal speeding ticket. Good job. Like you didn't actually have to like do anything to keep that. It's just here, right? I kept my gym membership. Did you go? No, but I have it, right? Like that's just this. So, so like, so the, the, uh, when I was um, a kid growing up, we used to go to California like every summer for vacation because my dad grew up in California. So he grew up SoCal beach boy. Um, he grew up in the Huntington area. So he was at the beach most days. And um, he, he told me a story. My first time out, like I was boogie boarding and he was like sharing this story with me. It was a father son moment. And he's like, you know, um, which by the way, like, you know, you've been a kid and you like get like, you're out, you're looking at the waves. You're like, wow, those are cool. And then you get into the water and you're, the water level's here. And now the waves are like, and you're like, oh, cool. And so my dad's like, you know, there was this one time when I was first like really getting into boogie boarding as a kid. I was like in junior high. And Huntington, by the way, is surf capital of the U.S. Like that's where the U.S. Open is every year. So it's a big deal. Real waves. And he goes out there. He's got his boogie board. And he's like looking at all these surfers. He's like, I'm going to go for it. Like I'm one of these guys, right? All right. And he goes out and he starts boogie boarding. And, you know, he's catching a few waves, getting pounded a few times. Um, but then he begins to notice like, oh, I don't, I don't see my, my towel. Um, I don't, that's weird. Oh, that's strange. Whatever. I guess I, maybe, maybe somebody stole it. Who knows? Whatever. But like, I, I don't see my stuff. And then he started looking. And if you've been to Huntington Beach, you know, there's a pier. And the pier is like square in the middle of like both sides of the surfing section. And so my dad's beginning to notice, oh, I'm getting closer to the pier. That's interesting. I don't think I've been like catching waves in that direction. That's strange. And, and then he begins to notice, oh, oh, now I'm actually, I'm trying to move away and I'm getting closer still. This is, this is a problem. And then he begins to notice a red truck following him on the shore. He's beginning to realize, I think this might be a problem. I think the lifeguards are concerned. Maybe I should be concerned. And then he starts trying to fight. And he's realizing this current is really strong and I'm actually not making any progress. And he gets to the point where he is now under the pier, which if you've ever been to Huntington Beach or probably any beach with a pier, you know that these piers, the pylons are coated in barnacles, which will literally rip you to shreds if you get up into them. So he is now under the pier getting sloshed into the pylons over and over and over and beginning to bleed and beginning to think, this is it. This is how I die. This is great. Cool. First time I try, I'm dead. Great. And, and then he notices, which you would think would be like this moment of like deliverance. He notices, he sees like just, you know, in the, like the cinematic view, the blur, he sees this like little pair of legs come off the pier. And this lifeguard swims up to him, which I'm imagining was probably like this really handsome ripped guy. And he's, but my dad's like junior high again. And the lifeguard's like, hey, bud, you need some help? Which is like, you know, thanks for the, thanks for patronizing me. Yes, I am dying. Why don't you pull me out? And so he gets towed out and he's like, this is the most humiliating thing. All the surfers, the high school boys in their wetsuits and their sick boards are looking at me like, nah, that guy. And so that is, so, so here's, here's the thing. My dad did not intend to avoid being pulled into the pier. He did not 
keep at avoiding the pier. If he would have, he would have stayed far away from it and continued. Like, you know what you do? Like you ride the wave in, get on the beach, move back up, get in, right? That's just, there's a thing, right? He did not keep that. It pulled him into the pylons. So that's what John's talking about here. You have to actively intend to keep Jesus' instruction, right? If I, as a kid, now my dad's told me this story and I'm like, I'm going to go. And same beach, great, cool, this is fun, right? I have to actively now keep his instruction or else I'm going to actively get shredded under the pier, right? And so that's what John's talking about. But then here's, the, here's, here's where this text gets a little heavy. So I hope you uh, were wearing our adult pants today. Here's what John says. Whoever says, I know him. I know Jesus. We're tight. Whoever says I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, that person's a liar. Which, by the way, if you're curious, the Greek word there is sustus. And it means every, so it shows up 10 times in the New Testament. Guess what it means every time? Liar. So like if you were like, well, maybe John meant something else. May, you know, there's, okay, most of the time we do like a word search in Bible software and there's like, well, there's like 20 different possible meanings. Here's the most likely meaning. Here's like some other options that it could be. This one shows up one color all the way around the pie chart. It says 10 times. Guess what? Liar. So here's what John's trying to say. He's not beating around the bush. He chooses words that cannot be mixed up. They can't be softened up. These are words that are meant to cut if you're under the knife. Liar. If you say, but you don't do, Liar. Sustus. Right? Next time you're like going around and you see something, like your kid tells a lie, be like, Sustus! Right? Like, they freak him out. So like, that's what John's saying. Now he loves, remember, two verses ago, he says, my children. He loves them. This is his family. But he loves them enough to be brutally honest with them. The kingdom of God in Jesus' words is here. It's at hand. And he's, John is saying, you, you are his, you're his people. You're the followers of Jesus. You are the way of Jesus. We have no, there's no like, oh, Wikipedia, what's a Christian? No, it's, well, I met one and here's what they were like. And John's saying, guess what? You, you are the kingdom of God on earth. That matters. And John's saying, don't kid yourself. If you say, but you don't keep, don't be mistaken. And like, that's the most loving, like, as if you're a parent, you know, sometimes just being like the, you know, bad cop, like hard truth, I'm just going to tell it to you straight. This is the most loving thing you can do. And that's what John's doing. He's saying, guys, we're literally being persecuted. We're literally being staked and lit on fire by the emperor of Rome if you didn't notice. So if you say, but don't actually do, don't make a mistake of thinking you're actually for real here. That has to sit with us. We have to just sit under that. We can't just like, well, good word. Great, cool. Like that's. And so again, to circle back like to the pylon story, like my dad, right? He can't be like, you know what, lifeguard? I had it under control. I promise. Like, don't worry. That was good. You just caught me in a bit of a, you know, it was a moment, but I had it, all right? What would the, what would the lifeguard say? Justice! Like, you. <laughs> He's like, I mean, like, literally, the lifeguard, if I were the lifeguard, I'd be like, great, peace. I'm going to go motorboat right out of here with my bare hands and watch you die, right? Great. So that's, that's what John's talking about. So then the implicit question here, this is what John's getting at. How do we keep? How do we keep Jesus' instruction? How do we keep Jesus' commandments? 
Well, the good thing is that John actually draws this conclusion for us. So again, talking about like biblical authors are really smart and they don't waste their words. Well, guess what? Here's what John does. He says, well, you know what? Let me help you out here. This first part, I'm gonna present my argument to you. Walk you through it a bit. But in case you're not clear, let me just help you out. How do you keep Jesus' commandments? There you go. All right, that's the beauty of, again, like when you actually read biblical authors closely, slowly, you begin to realize, oh, hey, they actually like connected the dots for you. How do you keep Jesus' commandments? You walk as he walked. Which again is a big ask for some of us. Most of us, all of us, right? Like this means becoming like Jesus to the point that when people experience us, they experience Jesus himself. Like that if you were to walk up to somebody, it'd be as if Jesus was walking up to them. Dallas Willard was spoken about as somebody who genuinely believed that if you just asked, Jesus would walk right up to you. That you could actually know him. That's what John's inviting us into. When, uh, when I was little, I would go, my dad was a, I'm talking about my dad a lot. It's Father's Day, it works, all right. So, but like when, when I was little, my dad, so he, he works, uh, he's, a, he's a teacher. He was also an athletic trainer at the time. And so he spent a lot of his hours at school to the point that my sister and I actually asked my mom one time, when are we going to dad's house? And that was like, this, you know, so, but, but I would spend a lot of time, you know, just kind of hanging out in his wake, you know, and, and just doing whatever he did. And I remember really, I was annoyed by it. Now it's endearing, but it's hindsight. So, but when I was walking with him, every person and their mother would literally go, you look just like your dad. I was like, cool. I don't know what to say about that. Like I didn't help. I didn't do that. Like I just, sorry. And then now like people are, I, it's, it's like, is it a compliment or not? I don't know. But when, when people say that now, I'm like, no, I'm actually like, that's endearing. That's sweet. They're like, man, like I look at pictures of my dad when he was my age. And I'm like, oh, okay. They weren't lying. They were for real. All right. But that's, but that's what John's getting at. He's saying, so you should walk with Jesus to the point that people just go, hey, you're just like Jesus, right? And here's what John's getting at. This is our main point. Again, this is the title of today's sermon. To follow Jesus, which is what I think most of us would say we're doing, to follow Jesus is to become like Jesus. To follow Jesus is to actively, actually become transformed into the image of Jesus himself. Which, by the way, I know we have fancy church words like sanctification, and we're like, Spirit's got it, bro. Guess what? Read the Gospels. That's not how it works, right? Jesus did not say, all right, I'm going to leave. You're pretty much off the hook. I'm sending the Spirit, so just like kick back. It's going to be good, right? No, he said, follow me. The Spirit was there the whole time, and yet Jesus still said, follow Keep, walk with me. And so, how do we actually do that? How do we actually become like Jesus? Well, the good news for us is that John spent three years following Jesus as one of his students. Jesus was a first century rabbi. And so, rabbis would invite their students in. They would say, all right, start by just watching me. Right? Show up to my house. Jesus didn't have one, but show up to my house early in the morning and just walk with me. Just watch what I do. Right? And then the next step, you say, all right, now you've seen what I do. Now join me in it. Right? Like now start, you know, helping out. Right? This is how apprenticeships worked. Not as much now, but in the earlier times, like most of history, you apprenticed. Right? And it's like, all right, you've seen how I shape the sword. Now you, here's the hammer. Give it a shot. Right? And then the next step was, okay, now you've watched. Now you've helped. Now I'll help you. Now you do what I do and I'll help. And the last step, what every rabbi would tell their students is, now you go and do likewise. Sound familiar? And so John knows what that means. And so here's what John's inviting us into. 
He's inviting us to actually become students of Rabbi Yeshua, Jesus, just like he was. And so, now the challenge is we're not first century Jewish uh, itinerant, you know, people looking for a rabbi to follow and we're not about to quit our jobs and just walk around with somebody all day. So how do we do that now? Well, the first thing is we have to know what would you actually experience if you were to experience Jesus as a rabbi? Well, the first thing is you would experience the eyes of Jesus. Right, so just imagine yourself walking with him every day. You begin to see what he sees. You begin to notice what he notices. You begin to go, oh, where's Jesus? Oh, he's looking at that person. Why aren't we looking at that person? I didn't even notice that person. Did you notice that person? No, but he noticed that person. You develop the eyes of Jesus. And then you develop the heart of Jesus. You begin to notice what burdens him? You're like, why does he have a stomach ache all of a sudden? What? Oh, oh, he cares. Oh. You begin to love what he loves. And then the last is you would develop the feet of your rabbi Jesus. You would move towards what he moves towards. You begin to go, okay, this is all happening and yet he's going this way. I guess we're going to go this way. You develop the feet of Jesus. So how do we do that now? Right, that's, that's the so what. How do we actually, you're like, great, well, this isn't first century Palestine, and I'm not a Jew. So how do I do that now? There's two ways that I'm going to just give you this morning, and they're really simple. First, is we have to be with Jesus. We have to have proximity to Jesus. We have to know him experientially. So how do you do that? Well, first, you spend time with him. You meditate slowly on his word, right? Not emptying your mind, but filling it and saturating it, right? Like Psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 1 says, I meditate on your word day and night like a tree planted by streams of living water. And then you are with him in prayer, being present with him in the spirit, which you can actually do. Did you know that? You can actually just be with Jesus. Brother Lawrence, uh, he was a, a cook in a 15th century monastery who he was actually more famous than anybody doing anything like serious in the monastery. He was the cook and everyone was like, this guy knows what's up. He called it practicing the presence of God. Getting to the point where you're just always mindful of the presence of God with you everywhere you go. And then when you realize that you've strayed, you just come right back. Paul called it praying without ceasing in Thessalonians. Right, that's, that's what we're being invited into when we are asked to be with Jesus. And then the second way that we can become like Jesus is we adapt his way of life. Which is the challenge for us? Because we're like, oh, you have to do something? Oh, geez. Like, like that's, again, this is physical. This is real. This is embodied. This isn't just intellectual tickle match, all right? This is like, you don't just get to feel convicted. You have to actually respond, right? And so, historically, the church has identified, what are the things that Jesus actually did? Like, if you just read the Gospels, what did he do? And then they've just made lists. There's no complete list, but it's been called the practices of Jesus or the spiritual disciplines. So there's some like silence and solitude, intentionally interrupting the idolatrous currents of our culture by getting alone with Jesus to be filled with living water. Or Sabbath, choosing to stop Shabbat and rest, shalom, amidst an anxious culture of never-ending hurry. Community, being nourished by our brothers and sisters in a culture of self-sufficiency and individualism. Worship, enthroning the king of creation in a culture that worships creation. Fasting, saying no to ourselves in a culture that doesn't know how. Generosity, looking to bless our neighbor in a culture that seeks to bless itself. 
serving, lowering ourselves for the sake of one another in a culture that uses and abuses one another. In confession, being vulnerable and honest in a culture built entirely upon fabricated identities and false reality. And as we regularly practice simple things like this, you can Google it, there's lists, spiritual disciplines. But as we just choose to do things like this, things that Jesus himself did, we begin to passively, unawares to ourselves, begin to function like Jesus did. Dallas Willard said, the, the goal of spiritual formation is this. Through practice, becoming the kind of person who naturally functions from the heart posture of Christ. Practice, right? When I was a baseball player, like Little League, the Diamondbacks were huge. They had just won a World Series. And so all my buddies and I were like, oh my gosh, we got to be like them. So my guy was Luis Gonzalez. Anybody? Gonzo? Great. So I, I was like, all right, I'm going to be just like Gonzo. So what did I do when I walked over the plate? Did the thing, you know, looked at the ump. And then, if you know, I opened up my stance. Because that's what Gonzo did. I had a friend who was really into um, another guy named Craig Council. He did this thing with his bat, right? And so you see all these, like, 10-year-olds out there, like, <laughs> who had never actually done a lick of the things that, Jesus, or that, that Craig Council or Luis Gonzalez didn't practice, Right? Right, but if we had actually done the things they had done, we begin to actually start to function like they do, right, naturally. And so that's what John's invite, inviting us into. And so as we close, here's what John is talking, he's, he's talking to his listeners, but he's also talking to us. And here's what he's inviting us into. He's inviting us into a lifelong journey of orienting the whole of our lives around Jesus himself. Which is what Jesus is inviting us into when he says, take my yoke upon you. Right? If this seems like a much bigger commitment than coming to church, it's because it is. It's a way of life. King Jesus, our rabbi, is inviting us to walk with him. Here and now. Or in his words, follow me. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would let this text cut us where it ought. And would you let it encourage us where it ought. Lord, we ask that by your spirit, we would truly learn what it means to walk in the easy yoke of Jesus, to truly follow the rabbi that we call friend that we call King. We love you, Father. And would we actively participate in the life that Jesus offers here and now? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.